Lady Susan, Part One. One. Lady Susan Vernon to Mr. Vernon, Langford, December. My dear brother. I can no longer refuse myself the pleasure of profiting by your kind invitation when we last parted, of spending some weeks with you at Churchill, and therefore, if quite convenient to you and Mrs. Vernon to receive me at present, I shall hope within a few days to be introduced to a sister whom I have so long desired to be acquainted with. My kind friends here are most affectionately urgent with me to prolong my stay. But their hospitable and cheerful dispositions lead them too much into society for my present situation and state of mind, and I impatiently look forward to the hour when I shall be admitted into your delightful retirement. I long to be made known to your dear little children, in whose hearts I shall be very eager to secure an interest. I shall soon have need for all my fortitude, as I am on the point of separation from my own daughter. The long illness of her dear father prevented my paying her that attention which duty and affection equally dictated, and I have too much reason to fear that the governess to whose care I consigned her was unequal to the charge. I have therefore resolved on placing her at one of the best private schools in town, where I shall have an opportunity of leaving her myself in my way to you. I am determined, you see, not to be denied admittance at Churchill. It would indeed give me most painful sensations to know that it were not in your power to receive me. Your most obliged and affectionate sister, S. Vernon. 2. Lady Susan Vernon to Mrs. Johnson. Langford. You are mistaken, my dear Alicia, in supposing me fixed at this place for the rest of the winter. It grieves me to say how greatly you were mistaken for I have seldom spent three months more agreeably than those which have just flown away. At present nothing goes smoothly. The females of the family are united against me. You foretold how it would be when I first came to Langford, and Mainwaring is so uncommonly pleasing that I was not without apprehensions for myself. I remember saying to myself as I drove to the house, I like this man, pray heaven no harm come of it. But I was determined to be discreet to bear in mind my being only four months a widow, and to be as quiet as possible. And I have been so, my dear creature. I have admitted no one's attentions but Mainwaring's. I have avoided all general flirtation whatever. I have distinguished no creature besides, of all the numbers resorting hither, except Sir James Martin, on whom I bestowed a little notice, in order to detach him from Miss Mainwaring. But if the world could know my motive there, they would honour me. I have been called an unkind mother. But it was the sacred impulse of maternal affection. It was the advantage of my daughter that led me on. And if that daughter were not the greatest simpleton on earth, I might have been rewarded for my exertions as I ought. Sir James did make proposals to me for Frederica. But Frederica, who was born to be the torment of my life, chose to set herself so violently against the match that I thought it better to lay aside the scheme for the present. I have more than once repented that I did not marry him myself, and were he but one degree less contemptibly weak, I certainly should. But I must own myself rather romantic in that respect, and that riches only will not satisfy me. The event of all this is very provoking. Sir James is gone, Maria highly incensed, and Mrs. Mainwaring insupportably jealous. So jealous, in short, and so enraged against me, that in the fury of her temper I should not be surprised at her appealing to her guardian, if she had the liberty of addressing him. But there your husband stands my friend, and the kindest, most amiable action of his life was his throwing her off for ever on her marriage. Keep up his resentment, therefore I charge you. We are now in a sad state. No house was ever more altered. The whole party are at war, and Mainwaring scarcely dares speak to me. It is time for me to be gone. I have therefore determined on leaving them, and shall spend, I hope, a comfortable day with you in town within this week. If I am as little in favour with Mr. Johnson as ever, you must come to me at 10 Wigmore Street. But I hope this may not be the case. 
for as Mr. Johnson, with all his faults, is a man to whom that great word respectable is always given, and I am known to be so intimate with his wife, his slighting me has an awkward look. I take London in my way to that insupportable spot, a country village, for I am really going to Churchill. Forgive me, my dear friend, it is my last resource. Were there another place in England open to me, I would prefer it. Charles Vernon is my aversion, and I am afraid of his wife. At Churchill, however, I must remain till I have something better in view. My young lady accompanies me to town, where I shall deposit her under the care of Miss Summers in Wigmore Street, till she becomes a little more reasonable. She will make good connections there, as the girls are all of the best families. The price is immense, and much beyond what I can ever attempt to pay. Adieu. I will send you a line as soon as I arrive in town. Yours ever, S. Vernon. 3. Mrs. Vernon to Lady de Courcy. Churchill. My dear mother, I am very sorry to tell you that it will not be in our power to keep our promise of spending our Christmas with you, and we are prevented that happiness by a circumstance which is not likely to make us any amends. Lady Susan, in a letter to her brother-in-law, has declared her intention of visiting us almost immediately, and as such a visit is in all probability merely an affair of convenience, it is impossible to conjecture its length. I was by no means prepared for such an event, nor can I now account for her ladyship's conduct. Langford appeared so exactly the place for her in every respect, as well from the elegant and expensive style of living there, as from her particular attachment to Mr. Mainwaring, that I was very far from expecting so speedy a distinction, though I always imagined from her increasing friendship for us since her husband's death, that we should, at some future period, be obliged to receive her. Mr. Vernon, I think, was a great deal too kind to her when he was in Staffordshire. Her behaviour to him, independent of her general character, has been so inexcusably artful and ungenerous since our marriage was first in agitation, that no one less amiable and mild than himself could have overlooked it all. And though, as his brother's widow and in narrow circumstances, it was proper to render her pecuniary assistance, I cannot help thinking his pressing invitation to her to visit us at Churchill perfectly unnecessary. Disposed, however, as he always is to think the best of every one, her display of grief and professions of regret, and general resolutions of prudence, were sufficient to soften his heart and make him really confide in her sincerity. But as for myself, I am still unconvinced, and plausibly as her ladyship now has written, I cannot make up my mind till I better understand her real meaning in coming to us. You may guess, therefore, my dear madam, with what feelings I look forward to her arrival. She will have occasion for all those attractive powers for which she is celebrated to gain any share of my regard and I shall certainly endeavour to guard myself against their influence, if not accompanied by something more substantial. She expresses a most eager desire of being acquainted with me, and makes very gracious mention of my children. But I am not quite weak enough to suppose a woman who has behaved with inattention, if not with unkindness, to her own child, should be attached to any of mine. Miss Vernon is to be placed at a school in London before her mother comes to us, which I am glad of, for her sake and my own. It must be to her advantage to be separated from her mother, and a girl of sixteen who has received so wretched an education could not be a very desirable companion here. Reginald has long wished, I know, to see the captivating Lady Susan, and we shall depend on his joining our party soon. I am glad to hear that my father continues so well, and am with best love, etc. Catherine Vernon. 4. Mr. de Courcy to Mrs. Vernon. Parklands. My dear sister, I congratulate you and Mr. Vernon on being about to receive into your family the most accomplished coquette in England. As a very distinguished flirt, I have always been taught to consider her, but it has lately fallen in my way to hear some particulars of her conduct at Langford, which prove that she does not confine herself to that sort of honest flirtation which satisfies most people but aspires to the more delicious gratification of making a whole family miserable. By her behaviour to Mr. Mainwaring she gave jealousy and wretchedness to his wife, and by her attentions to a young man previously attached to Mr. Mainwaring's sister, 
deprived an amiable girl of her lover. I learnt all this from Mr. Smith, now in this neighbourhood. I have dined with him at Hurst and Wilford, who is just come from Langford, where he was a fortnight with her ladyship, and who is therefore well qualified to make the communication. What a woman she must be! I long to see her, and shall certainly accept your kind invitation, that I may form some idea of those bewitching powers, which can do so much, engaging at the same time, and in the same house, the affections of two men, who were neither of them at liberty to bestow them, and all this without the charms of youth. I am glad to find Miss Vernon does not accompany her mother to Church Hill, as she has not even manners to recommend her, and according to Mr. Smith's account is equally dull and proud. Where pride and stupidity unite, there can be no dissimulation worthy notice, and Miss Vernon shall be consigned to unrelenting contempt. But by all that I can gather, Lady Susan possesses a degree of captivating deceit which it must be pleasing to witness and detect. I shall be with you very soon, and am ever your affectionate brother, R. de Courcy. 5. Lady Susan Vernon to Mrs. Johnson. Churchill. I received your note, my dear Alicia, before I left town, and rejoiced to be assured that Mr. Johnson suspected nothing of your engagement the evening before. It is undoubtedly better to deceive him entirely, and since he will be stubborn, he must be tricked. I arrived here in safety, and have no reason to complain of my reception from Mr. Vernon, but I confess myself not equally satisfied with the behaviour of his lady. She is perfectly well-bred, indeed, and has the air of a woman of fashion. But her manners are not such as can persuade me of her being prepossessed in my favour. I wanted her to be delighted at seeing me. I was as amiable as possible on the occasion, but all in vain. She does not like me. To be sure, when we consider that I did take some pains to prevent my brother-in-law's marrying her, this want of cordiality is not very surprising. And yet it shows an illiberal and vindictive spirit to resent a project which influenced me six years ago, and which never succeeded at last. I am sometimes disposed to repent that I did not let Charles buy Vernon Castle when we were obliged to sell it, but it was a trying circumstance, especially as the sale took place exactly at the time of his marriage, and everybody ought to respect the delicacy of those feelings which could not endure that my husband's dignity should be lessened by his younger brother's having possession of the family estate. Could matters have been so arranged as to prevent the necessity of our leaving the castle, could we have lived with Charles and kept him single, I should have been very far from persuading my husband to dispose of it elsewhere. But Charles was on the point of marrying Miss de Courcy, and the event has justified me. Here are children in abundance, and what benefit could have accrued to me from his purchasing Vernon? My having prevented it may perhaps have given his wife an unfavourable impression, but where there is a disposition to dislike, a motive will never be wanting. And as to money matters, it has not withheld him from being very useful to me. I really have a regard for him. He is so easily imposed upon. The house is a good one, the furniture fashionable, and everything announces plenty and elegance. Charles is very rich, I am sure. When a man has once got his name in a banking-house, he rolls in money. But they do not know what to do with it, keep very little company, and never go to London but on business. We shall be as stupid as possible. I mean to win my sister-in-law's heart through the children. I know all their names already, and am going to attach myself with the greatest sensibility to one in particular, a young Frederick, whom I take on my lap and sigh over for his dear uncle's sake. Poor Mainwaring! I need not tell you how much I miss him, how perpetually he is in my thoughts. I found a dismal letter from him on my arrival here full of complaints of his wife and sister, and lamentations on the cruelty of his fate. I passed off the letter as his wife's to the Vernons, and when I write to him it must be under cover to you. Ever yours, S. Vernon. 6. Mrs. Vernon to Mr. de Courcy. Churchill. Well, my dear Reginald, I have seen this dangerous creature, and must give you some description of her though I hope you will be soon able to form your own judgment. She really is excessively pretty. 
However you may choose to question the allurements of a lady no longer young, I must for my own part declare that I have seldom seen so lovely a woman as Lady Susan. She is delicately fair, with fine grey eyes and dark eyelashes, and from her appearance one would not suppose her more than five and twenty, though she must in fact be ten years older. I was certainly not disposed to admire her, though always hearing she was beautiful but I cannot help feeling that she possesses an uncommon union of symmetry, brilliancy, and grace. Her address to me was so gentle, frank, and even affectionate, that if I had not known how much she has always disliked me for marrying Mr. Vernon, and that we had never met before, I should have imagined her an attached friend. One is apt, I believe, to connect assurance of manner with coquetry, and to expect that an impudent address will naturally attend an impudent mind. At least I was myself prepared for an improper degree of confidence in Lady Susan. But her countenance is absolutely sweet, and her voice and manner winningly mild. I am sorry it is so, for what is this but deceit? Unfortunately one knows her too well. She is clever and agreeable, has all that knowledge of the world which makes conversation easy, and talks very well, with a happy command of language which is too often used, I believe, to make black appear white. She has already almost persuaded me of her being warmly attached to her daughter, though I have been so long convinced to the contrary. She speaks of her with so much tenderness and anxiety, lamenting so bitterly the neglect of her education, which she represents, however, as wholly unavoidable, that I am forced to recollect how many successive springs her ladyship spent in town while her daughter was left in Staffordshire to the care of servants, or a governess very little better, to prevent my believing what she says. If her manners have so great an influence on my resentful heart, you may judge how much more strongly they operate on Mr. Vernon's generous temper. I wish I could be as well satisfied as he is, that it was really her choice to leave Langford for Churchill, and if she had not stayed there for months before she discovered that her friend's manner of living did not suit her situation or feelings, I might have believed that concern for the loss of such a husband as Mr. Vernon, to whom her own behaviour was far from unexceptionable, might for a time make her wish for retirement. But I cannot forget the length of her visit to the Mainwarings, and when I reflect on the different mode of life which she led with them from that to which she must now submit, I can only suppose that the wish of establishing her reputation by following through late the path of propriety, occasioned her removal from a family where she must in reality have been particularly happy. Your friend Mr. Smith's story, however, cannot be quite correct, as she corresponds regularly with Mrs. Mainwaring. At any rate, it must be exaggerated. It is scarcely possible that two men should be so grossly deceived by her at once. Yours, etc., Catherine Vernon. 7. Lady Susan Vernon to Mrs. Johnson. Churchill. My dear Alicia, you are very good in taking notice of Frederica, and I am grateful for it as a mark of your friendship. But as I cannot have any doubt of the warmth of your affection, I am far from exacting so heavy a sacrifice. She is a stupid girl, and has nothing to recommend her. I would not, therefore, on my account, have you encumber one moment of your precious time by sending for her to Edward Street, especially as every visit is so much deducted from the grand affair of education, which I really wish to have attended to while she remains at Miss Summers. I want her to play and sing with some portion of taste and a good deal of assurance, as she has my hand and arm and a tolerable voice. I was so much indulged in my infant years that I was never obliged to attend to anything and consequently am without the accomplishments which are now necessary to finish a pretty woman. Not that I am an advocate for the prevailing fashion of acquiring a perfect knowledge of all languages, arts, and sciences. It is throwing time away to be mistress of French, Italian, and German. Music, singing, and drawing, etc., will gain a woman some applause, but will not add one lover to her list. Grace and manner, after all, are of the greatest importance. I do not mean, therefore, that Frederica's acquirement should be more than superficial, and I flatter myself that she will not remain long enough at school to understand anything thoroughly. I hope to see her the wife of Sir James within a twelvemonth. You know on what I ground my hope, and it is certainly a good foundation, for school must be very humiliating to a girl of Frederica's age. 
And by the by, you had better not invite her any more on that account, as I wish her to find a situation as unpleasant as possible. I am sure of Sir James at any time, and could make him renew his application by a line. I shall trouble you meanwhile to prevent his forming any other attachment when he comes to town. Ask him to your house occasionally, and talk to him of Frederica that he might not forget her. Upon the whole, I commend my own conduct in this affair extremely, and regard it as a very happy instance of circumspection and tenderness. Some mothers would have insisted on their daughters accepting so good an offer on the first overture, but I could not reconcile it to myself to force Frederica into a marriage from which her heart revolted, and instead of adopting so harsh a measure, merely proposed to make it her own choice, by rendering her thoroughly uncomfortable till she does accept him. But enough of this tiresome girl. You may well wonder how I contrived to pass my time here, and for the first week it was insufferably dull. Now, however, we begin to mend. Our party is enlarged by Mrs. Vernon's brother, a handsome young man, who promises me some amusement. There is something about him which rather interests me, a sort of sauciness and familiarity which I shall teach him to correct. He is lively and seems clever and when I have inspired him with greater respect for me than his sister's kind offices have implanted, he may be an agreeable flirt. There is exquisite pleasure in subduing an insolent spirit, in making a person predetermined to dislike acknowledge one's superiority. I have disconcerted him already by my calm reserve, and it shall be my endeavour to humble the pride of these self-important de Courcy still lower, to convince Mrs. Vernon that her sisterly cautions have been bestowed in vain, and to persuade Reginald that he has scandalously belied me. This project will serve at least to amuse me, and prevent my feeling so acutely this dreadful separation from you, and all whom I love. Yours ever, S. Vernon End of section